So we're going to kick off with Layla. And, um, Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> sorry, is that is that me, my turn to go? Or are you going yes. To... Sorry, yeah. sorry, okay. Hi, everybody. I'm excited <laughs> to see you. And I'm so sorry that we can't be together. And isn't coronavirus just rubbish? It is. Um, and, uh, but, you know, whilst it is very rubbish, and uh, as the MP, you know, as soon as I went into lockdown, casework tripled. And as you guys probably know, Oxford Western Abingdon is not really a, a constituency that lacks opinions or people writing in. We tend to, uh, I discovered at the last election, in fact, that I couldn't find another MP that gets more casework than I do, um, which I'm delighted by because I hope that that is partly a product of people knowing that if they write in, they get a response and, you know, there's, it's worthwhile doing. Um, so I'm, I, I hope that's a good thing. But then it tripled and uh, me and my office were just absolutely inundated whilst trying for the first time many of us to work from home um I, I don't tend to work that much from home i tend to work you know if i'm out about in the constituency it's out and about or if it's in my office in westminster again it's sort of zooming around all over the place it's quite it's the first time in three years that i have sat at desks regularly because uh, that's just not really usually the nature of the job um Parliament then for a brief while had a moment of sanity uh, where it decided that we could have virtual proceedings, uh, which then uh, very quickly descended into insanity when Jacob Rees-Mogg realised that it was just a bit too much like the modern world. Um, and uh, unfortunately now uh, we do have to go in on uh, a regular basis again, uh, which I personally think is an utter travesty. Um, you know, this is a time when I should be protecting my constituents and I think it is utterly, utterly irresponsible. Uh, that we are forced to do this. However, you know, I have to make that dif difficult choice between do I represent my constituents, which is my job, or do I risk uh, their health? I mean, I'm not worried about mine, to be perfectly frank. Uh, all the science is showing that people of my age are, are probably fine. Uh, it's more about the super spreading. So when I'm there, I'm very, very careful. I wear a mask as much as I can. Uh, I uh, admit, and this is, you know, in the context of certainly this meeting, not something I'm proud of, but I'm driving my car a bit more just because I, that way I avoid public transport because in London, that is where a lot of the transmission is happening. It doesn't give me any joy to say that and where I'm walking, I can, uh, but I am generally driving less. And uh, I, I think actually on that note, whilst coronavirus itself is obviously raising huge issues in society, you know, it's exposing lots of inequality. Many of us on this call, all of us, I would argue, um, have, have long campaigned against much of this. Um, actually, it's raising it in the eyes of the electorate. They can start to see the discrepancies. They're beginning to understand that, you know, obviously it's wrong that in Oxford, you are more likely to die if you live in an OX5 postcode compared to an OX2. Uh, you across the country are twice as likely to die from coronavirus if you're from a poorer background than a richer one. I mean, it's just the, the stark inequalities are entirely unfair. And at the same time, people are rediscovering the beauty of nature and the beauty of cycling and the beauty of walking and are recognizing, again, what I know we have discussed in many of these meetings before, that doing things differently doesn't have to be worse. In fact, it could even be better. Um, and that's what I've been trying to do during this crisis is protect those who are the most vulnerable, but also to make the positive case for why we don't have to go back to how things used to be. Um, I do want to highlight uh, one particular success which originated from campaigning uh, that I have been doing in, in uh, this period, which is on the coronavirus compensation scheme. So uh, right at the very beginning of the crisis, I suggested actually to BBC Oxford, I was very aware, you know, there's a lot of worry and consternation out there in the, in, the, in the public around what the messages are, what they can do. Um, and so I suggested to BBC Oxford that I did a surgery that was uh, completely over the radio. And they agreed and I was delighted by that. Started a bit of a trend. Um, but in that very first one that we did, a radiographer texted in actually to the programme. I don't know if anyone uh, had, was listening to this at the time. Um, and he was a radiographer for JR. Uh, said that he had a nine-year-old daughter. Uh, his wife also works at the JR. They're both frontline workers. And he was concerned that they don't have any close friends or family in the area and were concerned what would happen if they both passed away because of COVID-19 to their daughter and her financial stability. 
and or any of her stability, but he was particularly worried about that. And then he said, well, is there not some sort of army style compensation scheme for people who are on the front line? And I said, well, I don't know is the honest answer, but I'm going to go away and look at it. And if there isn't, I will campaign on it. So I did and very quickly discovered that there are some death in service benefits. But to be honest, even those who do sign up to be a doctor or a nurse uh, and sign up to these benefits, they don't expect to do it in this kind of circumstance where you yourself are so uh, much in the firing line, so to speak. Uh, so I started campaigning and uh, I as often you know begins you write a letter to other MPs saying this really should happen will you come and join my campaign um, and I was uh, delighted and also slightly shocked to discover that there were backbench Tory MPs who really liked this idea um, including people like Bernard Jenkin now for those who don't know Bernard Jenkin you might have seen him because he often is on the same couch as me on Newsnight simply because we are so polarly opposite in our views politically that they bring us both on for balance um, and so we kind of know each other from there um, and he said this is a great idea I'm going to make representations on this behind the scenes um, for context he now chairs the liaison committee which is the super committee of committee chairs that gets to uh, grill the prime minister so he's, he's quite close into Boris or he'd never have gotten uh, that position so he starts making the call for it behind the scenes meanwhile I'm getting backbench Tories signing this letter and then and this is the bit that I still just fills me with you know alternate universe it is Alice through the looking glass the Daily Express call me and say we love this campaign we want to put it in front of our paper for five days running we're gonna we're gonna make this happen this is the right thing to do and not only that they were happy to credit me and my party with the campaign now the only time that I am normally in the Daily Express the Brexit loving Daily Express is for them to call me a you know horrid Ramona um, and I do get, you know, that's basically where they, they do it just to hurl abuse. So for them to have contacted me and to, to say this, I, I was I was pretty, pretty shocked. Uh, but you don't look a gift horse in the mouth. You go, thank you very much. Yes, of course. And they use their number 10 uh, question uh, during the briefings to ask uh, Matt Hancock about this. Uh, and he said, oh, I'll give it consideration. We got excited. And every week we'd go through this period of, oh, something else interesting is happening. Oh, something else interesting happening. And then about a couple of weeks later, uh, they announced uh, that they were going to do it. Uh, and that is a direct result of a constituent calling in and a campaign run absolutely started locally. And now every family who is an NHS or social care worker uh, who's, uh, who die uh, because of COVID-19 gets £60,000. Um, I'm really proud of that. And I'm really proud of our community uh, because it was very much a, a locally driven campaign um, and it's made a real difference to people. So I'm really, really very proud of that. Yeah. But now looking forwards, um, there is also an opportunity in COVID-19. And the opportunity, of course, is what we do next. Only 9% of people want to go back to how it was, which is great. Uh, people are enjoying the fact that they are working from home. Uh, and especially if that's a choice, uh, then that's great. Um, but they're also enjoying not having to drive as much. They're enjoying having some time a bit more with their friends and family. Uh, they're enjoying having clean air to breathe because there just aren't as many cars out and about. I know people who have tried cycling for the very first time. That's fantastic. Um, and so I think we need to not just dwell on the difficulties ahead of us. I mean, let's not underestimate those. We are heading for a one in 300 year are already in, in fact, a one in 300 year economic event. This is going to be very, very difficult. Um, but we also need to build back better. I know there's a question on this later, um, and, and so I'll save some of that for that. Uh, but what I've been doing is thinking very deeply about this. Um, and so I've written a book, well, not just alone. Uh, I'll show you the, the front cover as, as sort of printed, but it's that. And it's Build Back Better, and it's policy ideas for my party. Um, but I'm hoping that others will steal it. And it's very much making the case for what we do locally, very much that progressive politics and saying that we have to do things differently. And one of the, my favorite chapters in it is the green chapter. And it talks about a green recovery, but it also makes the link between that and biodiversity. Um, and I'll, I'm pleased to be able to uh, talk about that later. I know there's again, more questions on this, um, but I'm, I'm going for leadership of my party and I hope, uh, 
you've seen that I have put environmentalism as one of my key pillars, as one of the key planks. And it's environment, uh, it's education, and it's economy. And those are the three big issues of the day, because without those three, uh, then we are going to find ourselves in a situation where we're not going to be able to build back better. You're going to have to get people retrained to go into new jobs. We're going to have to have a massive green recovery package that is really, really ambitious, um, but that uh, also brings people along with it. Uh, and that's not going to take, uh, it's not going to be easy. Um, but the big change that we can make, and I know, uh, actually, I'm pretty sure it was Halima who first raised this uh, with me. Um, I, I have since gone on to action, uh, what you said, the work of Kate Raworth, who I know is a, you guys are a big fan of, and so am I. And I've been looking into a lot of her work. I've also spoken in the past about uh, other uh, economists that I'm really interested in, in in this space. And the way I've been talking about the economy is that we need an economy that puts well-being at its heart. And it's not just well-being about people. It's recognizing that that also includes the whole of the planet. It includes our entire uh, ecosystem. And that well-being is not just about mental health. It's also about uh, decarbonization. It's also about clean air. It's also about human infrastructure. You know, how do we make sure that we have the human infrastructure uh, to be able to lead the best lives uh, that we should be able to lead? And that it's not just about growth. Growth is one aspect of an economy, but you need a suite of different indicators that help you make better decisions. And unless we fundamentally change the way that we approach the economy, then this Build Back Better uh, rhetoric that even the government itself has adopted, um, unfortunately, is going to go nowhere. They fundamentally have to address the way that they manage their money and how they make the decisions that they do. Uh, so those are the three planks of my campaign. Um, I, it's going pretty well. I have no idea if I'm going to win or not, uh, but I think we're in with a chance. And um, if I do, then what I will be aiming to do in terms of collaboration uh, is absolutely working in a national way, in the same way that we do locally, building trust between the progressive parties and being in the best possible position to take out Boris at the next election. I mean, that has to be what we focus on now um, at a parliamentary level, um, but along the way to make the case for why COVID-19 is frankly a dress rehearsal compared to what we face if we don't get a grip on the nature and the climate emergency that lies in front of us. Um, and those are very much two of my, my big aims. Uh, whether I win or not, I will continue uh, along those lines. But I hope to be able to win because actually, if we don't do this now, then when on earth are we gonna do it? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> very well said. Um, we, we have very little time, but uh, I, I think maybe we'll start off with the questions and then uh, Ben and um, uh, Ben and Sam can introduce themselves before they answer the question uh, because we didn't do that in the beginning. I'm trying to rush along a bit. Um, but um, Jane, do you want to ask your question? I'm, I'm, there are some things appearing in the chat that uh, are about what you just said, but let's go into our questions first and if we have time, we'll come back to this later. Okay, Jane? Um, yeah, hi Leila. Although this is beginning to change, liberal and climate movements in the UK have an unfortunate history of being dominated by metropolitan and white middle class voices. How can we actively make sure that we reach out to wider communities and include a diverse range of voices in the conversation? How do we ensure that the local and national climate movement is not only transformative and radical, but has a broad base of support in addressing the systemic racial, gender and class inequalities that have got us to this position? Perfect question. Do you want me to start with that, Halima, or do you want to go? To yes, you start and then uh, Ben and Sam will answer. So, I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement, I think, has absolutely raised this to the fore. Um, and it's not just in, you know, conversations about climate it's actually conversations about absolutely anything uh, on that specifically what I've been calling for is changes to the education system so that we look again at for example how we teach history but also how we teach English um, you know what are the books what's the way that we view ourselves as a nation I've been calling for big companies to be making donations to uh, BAME groups 
uh, if they themselves have a history of uh, making any money off the slave trade and that's been my campaign over the last couple of days again bizarrely i've been doing this with the telegraph i don't know how i'm doing this but somehow these right-wing papers love to campaign with me on liberal issues don't ask me why but it seems to be working um, and actually we just need as many allies across the whole political spectrum that we can get so i'm not about to turn them down um, but actually to the more local stuff, I mean, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think partly we have all responsibilities as political parties in making sure that we are more uh, diverse. I've set uh, the bar for my own uh, national campaign that we're doing right now as part of the leadership campaign. I think that we, uh, in fact, there's an independent article that literally has just landed where I, I criticize my own party for being too old and too white. Um, and what we do need to do is attract more people who are younger, who are more diverse into politics, because if their voices aren't heard, then you just don't get the same diversity of voices in the room. And it's not rocket science, actually. If we find ourselves in a position where, as a constituency party, we aren't representing the community that we hope to be represent, what well, we aren't representative of, the community that we hope to represent, then actually I think we should be challenging ourselves on that. Um, a long time ago, Oxford West and Abingdon Lib Dems set better targets for male female participation in uh, its, uh, its membership. And actually on that, we're not bad, um, but actually we're not that brilliant at BAME representation. Um, and so a little tweaks can be made. Uh, for example, I was out with the Hindu community delivering uh, food to the food bank in Kidlington the other day and met a couple of lovely people and asked them all to join you know and and it's just remembering to do that so you make sure that you are actively recruiting people from different communities rather than just assuming because what happens in the end is that you recruit a friend who recruits a friend who recruits a friend and you're working within your own little bubble and you're not breaking out of that bubble so it's about breaking out of your bubble maybe breaching your comfort zone and if you aren't representative of the community that you wish to represent that also includes socioeconomic background um, then why not go to where they are and ask them to come and join and i think the same applies to the movement at large but i think as political parties uh we have a particular responsibility in that it's kind of hard to know exactly what to do but those are the good ideals sam would you like to say something about that I'll leave this to Ben, actually. I think okay. he's uh, been thinking about this a bit more than me. Unmute yourself, Ben. Okay, okay great. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, shall I introduce myself first? Or oh, yes, please. Yeah, so um, hi everyone. I'm Ben Saywood. I'm a young Green. I'm standing for the city council elections in Osney and St. Thomas. Um, I'm also the uh, secretary of the Oxford North and West branch. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in kind of following on from Layla. Um, that yeah, we, we absolutely as a movement need to go into spaces that we haven't occupied before and ask, why are you not joining us? What barriers have we erected to keep people out? And in, in other movements, there are issues such as in Extinction Rebellion where you know, you're engaging with the police as a benign force which someone a person of color or someone who's experienced this very negative attention from the police for their entire lives is not going to want to engage with your movement in that way um and we can draw on people's experiences in that way to try and fix our issues within the green movement so you know because people of color representation and other, you know, um, minority representations in politics are not as big of a problem for other parties. Um, you know, Labour has very good representation of um, minorities and everything else. So we should be asking ourselves, what is it about us that's, yeah, having, having these you know, very uncomfortable conversations so that we can grow as a party and make sure that we don't leave anyone behind. Um, because if we, if we, if our vision for the future is leaving someone behind, it's, it's not going to work and we're never going to, it's never going to happen if we don't have people on board. Um, yeah, we don't want to become the Margaret Thatcher of this century by laying off all the, 
all of you know the coal oil gas workers and not giving them something you know to uh, you know a reformative vision for the future where everyone is leveled up everyone you know we build back better and no one's left behind mm. um we should also use the platform that we have um to raise people's voices that aren't male and white you know i i say this with a strong sense of irony of course but um you know so something that i'm particularly proud of uh, within our party actually is using the book club for the first well the first time that i know of anyway to promote a black author actually um and you know that's fantastic using our platform to promote people who have a very different lived experience than us mm -hmm. yeah hmm. would you like to add to anything sam um, no, no, I'll go on. I think Ben's said it really adequately, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll go on from there. Um, I just would like to say, I would like to hear people say out loud in Parliament, Black Lives Matter and Palestinian Lives Matter. I'd just like to hear that out loud said. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question now. Chris, um, Chris Caddy, would you like to introduce yourself and say what your question is? Yes. Um, my name is Chris Caddy. I'm a retired town planner. Um, I've been retired 25 years, but uh, before that I worked for the Vale of Whitehorse District Council. For 17 years I was director of planning and for 12 years of that I was responsible for the council house building program. So I'm very concerned about the problem of trying to get affordable housing. And much is, as a so question says, much affordable housing is not affordable affordable because the developer, who could be a housing association or local authority, has to pay the development value of the land rather than its existing use value, which is mostly farmland and very much cheaper. And so the landowner reaps a large capital gain from simply being the fortunate owner, while the developer not only has to pay for the land at its developed value, but also of course has to fund the infrastructure and any social housing to be provided. Various solutions to this question of who benefits from the planning permission to develop including capital gains tax, planning gain, and the Community Land Act of 1975, have been tried, but all have flaws, or generally have lacked political support. So would it not be possible to return to something like the original system, which began with the Town and Country Planning Act of 1947, in which land for public purposes may be acquired at existing use value, or in order to make sure that uh, give an incentive for the landowners to sell, with the landowner receiving a small proportion of the increase in value, but most of it going in order to develop the land and able to sell the, or, or to provide the houses for rent uh, at, at a really affordable level. So that's my question. Please, Leila. Right. <laughs> We're trying to keep it as, as quick as possible. Well, I will try. And you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to pretend to have read any of the acts that you've just referred to, because I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> and so to this to this specific question of should we go back to that specific act I don't know but the principles that you're talking about there I have long championed and completely agree with in Oxfordshire we do have a particular problem which is affordable is the absolutely the wrong name um, whenever I talk about it uh, it's I talk about genuinely affordable um, because affordable is 80% of market value and 80% of market value uh, in places like Oxfordshire is just completely out of reach, even for most middle class people, it's out of reach these days. It causes all sorts of issues. It means that rents are higher too. It has an impact on my constituents who are on universal credit, for example, and the housing benefit uh, uh, levy that they would uh, be able to get, even with discretionary housing benefit, isn't enough and they have to move out. Um, that severs them from their support networks. It means that they uh, then have you know, a spiral sometimes into uh, loneliness. I mean, it's, it really is a huge problem. It's a societal issue, which itself costs money. Um, so one of the ways that we need to look at all of this is its wider impact on society. Governments are terrible at doing this. Secondly, I think we do need to redefine what affordable is. Um, and I think it should be a multiple of uh, average wage uh, in an area uh, rather than an, uh, a fraction of average rent, which is a, a different thing, or average price, which is a different thing. 
Um, but thirdly, I'm a big fan of land value taxation, or at least as much as I understand it. Um, and the, the idea behind that is that when it's actually, I think it's very similar to what you're proposing. Essentially, uh, if a landowner, for example, has a massive field and they then apply for planning permission for a bunch of houses on the field, if they can get it, uh, if once they've got the planning permission, or for example, it used to be something that was allocated in Greenbelt and then suddenly is removed for uh, in a local plan and is no longer in Greenbelt, as you all know, something that I have vociferously uh, campaigned against in Oxfordshire for a long time. And I'm sad to say uh, that battle remains ongoing slash uh, I'm a little pessimistic uh, about uh, the changes that need to be made to protect our Greenbelt from uh, the gross over overdevelopment that Oxford City's unmet need has uh, has given everyone. I'm going off on a rant on another direction, so I'm going to stop. Um, but what it would mean is that if that land suddenly increased in value, uh, then the landowner would be taxed accordingly because essentially it's unearned wealth. Um, and I, I do think that we need to have a conversation as a country about how we deal with unearned wealth. Uh, and if you are lucky enough to own that much land in the first place, and then it doubles or triples in value because of nothing you did or minimal amount uh, that you might have done, uh, that is fundamentally unfair uh, and just embeds all the inequalities that we are all here to, to try and uh, stop. So uh, I thank you for your question. I, I will go and, and look up those acts now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Sam? Hi, yeah, hi everyone. Um, so it's Sam Casey Rare, right? I'm um, South Oxfordshire District Councillor for the Green Party, and um, this issue is taxing us an awful lot at the moment, as you can imagine. For those of you who know, our, our, our local plan is uh, just about to go to examination, having forced, forced us to go to examination on it. Um, um, the fundamental thing here is, I think, in, from the Green Party point of view, is that housing has become and is treated as um, a form of speculative investment. And this is the problem with it. So um, we've got, we've got you know, so many uh, drivers for pushing up house prices. And one of them, I think you're right, is, is that uh, the, land, the land value goes directly to the landowner immediately. And um, as Leda says, you know, land value taxes are Green Party policy. It's something that will um, be a mechanism for being um, allowing much more equitable um, payback, if you like, for those landowners who uh, at the moment can make a bomb. And the, um, the Town and Country Planning Act does allow that, that does have a mechanism for, for public uh, ownership of land at, at that, that, at the price uh, that, so, or in a small increase uh, of the price it would be for agricultural land. And, we, you know, we need, we need to push that. Uh, we need to allow that. We need to uh, free up local authorities uh, to use the public loans boards to uh, to buy to buy that land, increase uh, community land trusts as well. Um, and you know, it's not just about. I mean, the problem that a, a lot of people think of housing and the housing crisis um, and the amount of money that's going is is that it's a it's a demand and supply issue, and it, it's clearly not. There are clearly many drivers. Um, homelessness is a particular problem in Oxford, but it's a particular problem in only a few other areas. It's concentrated in other areas, and it shows that uh, it's it, the, there's an imbalance in the economy. So there's 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 a whole areas that we need to focus on as well. And I think that's what the Green Party is saying: is rebalance the economy, increase community land trusts, um, and uh, bring transparency to the land market. That's the, that's the other thing. It's, it's it's shrouded in secrecy. We don't know who owns what. We don't uh, see what the prices are. Um, and I think the the other push we want to do is for custom build for um, uh, allowing people to build their own houses so that the local authorities can buy land at a small a small uplift, pass that on in small parcels um, to people who can then. Uh, build their own houses. I think that's been done a little bit in Vista, but um, that's, I think, uh, going back to what your question was, that the, the, the mechanism is, is there, the mechanism in law is there in that country planning act, and I think that's, that's what we need to um, ensure we can actually uh, let the local authorities um, do that. Mm -hmm. 
Do you have anything to add to that, Ben? Um, yeah, something super quickly, I guess. Um, so I kind of looked at this question in a, in a kind of a different angle. I didn't look at the acts that were being questioned, much like Layla didn't. Um, but instead, I looked around this idea of viability when you're assessing projects. Um, and it does suggest, actually, under the um, national planning policy framework yeah i think i put that right um that you do use um the existing use value use value of the land plus a little bit for encouraging the landowner to sell it on part of the problem that i see is developers are using this viability assessment to shirk on responsibilities such as infrastructure and social housing so if we redesigned the laws around viability i think that would also go hand in hand with this idea of yeah sell you know forcing the sale of land at its existing value okay mm -hmm. um yeah um yeah it's also as uh, uh josh has said that it's also a big uh BAME question as well because of inherited wealth uh, with the land. Um, we're going to, we can go into that a bit more later. Um, okay, well, following from the, the question of, of, of land and housing, I'd like to ask a question about homelessness because um, what are you and your party doing to ensure that no one is left homeless due to immigration status, domestic abuse, or slavery? Yeah, thank you very much. This is, as you guys know, one of my big campaigns that I've been running for a long time now. Again, very much locally conceived, the Vagrancy Act uh, as a emblematic act that is uncompassionate, uh, was started uh, as a petition uh, by students here in Oxford that I then took on and I've been running with in Parliament uh, and using that as a vehicle through which to talk about things like housing first programmes, um, but coronavirus, I think, has really, it goes to show what can be achieved when you put your mind to it, huh? Yeah. Within two weeks, within two weeks, homelessness was not solved at all, but rough sleeping uh, and people being able to at least have a roof over their head was solved because local authorities were given extra money by government to find a place for people. And off the back of that, I have been hearing some really positive stories of people for the very first time being able to access the support that they didn't even know was there or just the fact that their health has improved so much from not having to sleep outside day in day out um, they are able to now make progress in a way that they didn't before and it's why uh, I have introduced a bill into this into the house uh, in addition to my scrap the act uh, bill but in addition a housing first bill so that we never go back to a situation where this ever happens again. I thought it was actually quite interesting that the government, um, I don't know if you guys saw this, but there was a, a whisper that they might withdraw the funding. Uh, there was one article about it and then it blew up. Um, and then the next day they absolutely retracted the statement. Oh, oh no, that was never the case, which is brilliant. I don't even care if it's true or not. I just want it to remain true that they are going to keep funding this, uh, especially at a time when hotels and the leisure, leisure industry in general is really struggling. It just makes so much sense that that's what you would use money to do. Um, my concern, however, is a bit, it's a bit of a sticking plaster and we need to continue um, to make sure that people have the decency of a roof over their heads um, and that we have the infrastructure and the money to allow local councils to do this properly. And the very last thing I'll say um, is I also think we need to be starting to focus a little more on the dignity of the individual. What I'm learning as I go through this journey of understanding all the different multifacets or complex uh, ways that homelessness manifests is that one of the things that homeless people themselves say is really unhelpful is that they are treated very much like a number. Um, there are pathways that they go down. Uh, if they don't meet one particular pathway, then they are rejected from being able to be given housing, for example, or if they don't agree to the intervention that uh, they are told is the right thing for them, then uh, quite often they are stopped from reaching the next step. Uh, and that's just so inhuman because humans are complex. 
and it's not so obvious that one step immediately follows the other. Um, and it's something that I know that the Lib Dems and the Greens on Lab on Labour uh, on Oxford City Council have been working together on for for a number of years. We have the same approach uh, there. But I'm absolutely committed to making sure. Uh, and Sue, yes, you will be pleased to know that I do back UBI now. Um, I do, because coronavirus has made me a convert. Um, before, I mean, Frank, I was always very critical of universal credit, um, but coronavirus has made me completely against that to an extent where we now realize there are so many people falling through the cracks and uh, I am actively calling as part of my leadership campaign for a UBI. Mm -hmm. Step in the right direction, yes. <laughs> um, okay, uh, next question is from Josh Diru. Can you, um, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you, uh, introduce yourself and say what your question is. Sure, thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Josh Drew from the Green Party as well. Um, my question is kind of about Build Up Better and obviously your big announcement this morning, but um, the government itself has spoken quite a lot about the need for building back better with the green recovery, but it's kind of already gone against that with a lot of its actions in terms of boiling out, bailing out the oil sector, bailing out the airlines um, without any strings. And my question is what can we do and what can you yourself commit to doing? Yeah. to hold decision makers accountable and ensure that we kind of generally have a transformative recovery that you know is a proper green new deal that decarbonizes the society protects the workers and the most vulnerable and also builds solidarity across the borders and i guess yeah. like in reference to release this morning which was great but given that we have a Tory government for four years how are we going to kind of put that into place yeah well i mean there's sort of two parts to that so i think we agree with with much of it um the the fact that they have been giving unconditional bailouts is not something that I've supported. And when there have been you know, opportunities to sort of sign things or push for things, uh, that's a condition of mine. And we absolutely need to make sure that there is green uh, conditions attached to any kind of bailout, especially for the big companies who are also, I mean, BA is, is a great example of this. They are treating their workers like rubbish, um, not with any respect for them whatsoever. Um, but the thing is, and I think this is, rather than just holding them to account, I think we can also make them see that it's in their own interest to do this properly. Uh, there was a paper, I understand, I haven't read it, but I was told about it, um, that Oxford uh, did, where it showed uh, that a green stimulus package is not just the best way of uh, ensuring that we bolster the environment, but it's also the best way to help supercharge the economy right now because so many of the things that you need to do in order to decarbonize in particular are really labor intensive um, so if you are for example going to uh, insist on you know clean energy um, then you are going to have to have massive investment in infrastructure for renewables in areas that currently have oil and gas um, i've been uh, talking a lot with my colleagues in Scotland about what that would look like. I mean, Aberdeenshire, you suddenly shut down that industry. That's most of the jobs in that part of the country. So we don't want to end up in a situation like Thatcher, as Ben was suggesting earlier, where you've got industries that are completely on their knees and you just leave people behind and you don't have communities that are supported. Um, so what we've called for there are just transition funds, which means that you can... Uh, at, encourage people who are already skilled up to consider other careers and then to have massive investment uh, in parts of the country in uh, those industries that are going to be declining. Uh, and actually, I think it's a good thing um, that the airline industry, uh, frankly, is looking again at how it does things. Um, I think we do need to support the workers while that happens. Another reason why I support UBI, I mean, there's so much that is solved by uh, campaigns like that. Building zero carbon homes, if we did that properly, again, very labor intensive, uh, very, very important uh, for, you know, what of all these people who are in the leisure, leisure industry, uh, who currently don't, don't have jobs, they're furloughed perhaps for a while, um, but who knows how long that's going to last. Wouldn't it be superb if we could retrain a lot of those people to be retrofitting um, and then doing things like mass tree planting. I mean, we know that it's not just about decarbonizing, it's also about rewilding. And there is a big part to be played uh, in that. But unless we start planting the trees that we need now uh, for the next 10 years, 
uh, because they need to get big in order to start capturing the carbon uh, in the levels that we need to see, um, then that would be a really good use of retraining money. So I, I, it, it's so obvious that this is what the government should do. I think actually it's a case of not just you know, showing them that what they're doing is wrong, but maybe also a bit of carrot, not just stick, and making them see that there is positive things that they can do to help the economy, because that is, of course, the only thing that Tories care about, um, but that this is the thing that they should do in order to make sure that they have the economy that, that they want. Um, I, I am medium optimistic that they're going to do a bit more than they have been, I'm not at all optimistic that they are going to do it in the order that we know that they need to uh, in order to get to, you know, in 10 years time, completely decarbonize our energy industry, for example. They're just not doing what they need to do. Um, and so I think one of the ways we can hold them to account is just point out that if they're serious about even carbon neutral by 2050, um, then they need to be doing much, much more than they are now. Mm. Um, before I get to, to Ben and, and Sam on that, who I forgot to ask about the homelessness thing, um, I just wanted to catch one little question that was asked earlier and following on from what you just said about these uh, people working and, and um, building back better with people having new jobs. Earlier, a question from Barbara Harris. Um, when you were talking about the compensation for, for death in service, would that be extended to private agency workers and zero hour contract workers or is this just for permanent nhs staff because it seems to me if we are going to build back better we have to take care of the people who are taking care of people yeah exactly so when i originally called for it i wanted it for any key worker in any industry at all actually um that was considered uh, you know, on their front line, which would include people like supermarket workers, which would include not just NHS and social care workers, but anyone who had been deemed essential at that point. Um, the government hasn't quite delivered on that. Um, and what they've said is it's just for NHS and social care workers, but it does extend to people on zero hours contract. There's also, there's lots of different types of contracts in the NHS. One of the problems with the death and service benefits is that first of all, there were a number of people who didn't sign up to the pension scheme because it was linked to the pension scheme because they weren't earning enough first and second year nurses for example just couldn't afford it so chose to opt out and so were therefore not eligible for the death and service benefit um, but then also people like porters and, and other people like that um, so this does cover them mm -hmm. okay um, right so um, Sam or um, Ben would you like to yeah um, yeah, I can talk a little bit about this Build Back Better because, um, you know, it's a unique opportunity that exists now. And I think that we need to we need to be using the tax system better. You know, we've got billions from quantitative easing and the, uh, the bailouts from, from the Bank of England. And uh, it's really got to be focused on the, you know, the, the outcomes we want. Um, and it's it's... We know, we, we know what we need to do. We know we don't need any more particular technology. We know we need um, a, a big solar power industry. Um, we know that we need, we were just talking earlier, weren't we, about broadband, access to broadband, better broadband, maybe broadband being a human right. Um, if we, people can work more at home, if children can, are going to be working at school for part-time and at home for part-time, this might be much, much longer than we think. All these things can be can be done if we want to do it. We know about the New Deal after the Second World War. Well, we know that it's just a focus of mind, and I think it's it's using using those um, macroeconomic mechanisms. It's really really important that, that that's the way you do it. Mm -hmm. uh, ben, do you have anything, Dad? No, nothing for me. It was almost okay. very well. Uh huh. It seems like we kind of agreeing a lot of things. Um, there's a question from Shishila who's not here, um, but um, um, Sarah's gonna make, ask it. Um, yes, Shishila Dahl um, sends her apologies, but um, her question is this, in the light of the climate emergency, what actual steps can be taken locally and nationally to cut our carbon footprint? accepting that private motorised traffic is the main source of emissions in the UK, but we need to go beyond token gestures and window dressing to change the ways we live, work and travel. 
For example, over the past 40 years, it's become impossible to cycle between county towns because of motorised traffic levels. How do we begin to tackle this sort of issue? So, um, first of all, I'm going to start with a rant about the county council. Uh, <laughs> Uh, which is well rehearsed, but actually, even in the but in the context of COVID, I found this really, really frustrating because the government at one point then announced two billion fu two billion uh, pound fund to address some of these issues, and so I started writing to Ian Hutzberth about you know the B four zero four four path as a very good example of a, a way uh, to reduce uh, cyclists getting. Uh, knocked over on that really dangerous road and encourage people to cycle rather than uh, to use public transport or their cars. And the county has absolutely dragged its heels. I'm also disappointed with the city. I think there is much more that they could be doing to uh, reduce emissions at this time. I think the one way system for pedestrians whilst they allow the traffic to flow freely is very silly. Um, why not just close the whole thing and make it completely pedestrianised and have a proper street culture uh, in the centre of Oxford? That's what I would have much rather have seen. And the number of people who I know who, as I said earlier, very first time in their lives are cycling because they feel it's safer. Uh, we now have had word that the work along the Botley Road is going to start. Well, that's great. Um, but they could have made that even better and had a proper segregated cycle lane, which they had said was too expensive. Um, but, you know, uh, they're now going to be making tweaks. So I, I agree with the thrust of what Shashida is saying. It is feeling like it is going to be window dressing. Um, but actually, there should be an area that actually central government has a massive part to play in getting people out of cars and it comes and also converting them into electric cars. Um, subsidies worked really well for a while, and I think they should bring those back. Um, one of the long standing Lib Dem policies is to have um, electric charging points in um, streetlights because they are everywhere in suburban and urban areas and they already have an electricity so source. Why don't you convert every street lamp uh, into a, a lamp plus a charger? Um, so it's not just one or two spots on a road, it's actually pretty much everywhere. Um, we should be banning all sales of new and old diesel cars um, within uh, by 2030 and that's long-standing again Lib Dem policy that was in our last uh, manifesto uh, and we need to be encouraging people out of cars altogether which is mass uh, uh, yeah and so yes buses and public transport I completely agree with you uh, I completely agree with you that's where should we should going we should be going is uh, I'm really sad that the pick-me-up service has said that it's no longer viable um, because actually that's exactly the kind of thing that we should be subsidizing from local government right now not cutting and it's, it's not about it's a cut or not it's just that they couldn't make it commercially viable uh, that's something that should be supported um, the last thing I'll say though is about how you deliver this kind of stuff and it kind of alludes to what Shashila was saying um, which was that I think local government is the vehicle through which we should be getting people out of vehicles it's very often local government that can decide to push forward a new station. And I've been pushing for Wantage uh, Grove Station, actually. I've been pushing for the Cowley Branch Line to reopen. Um, it should be all devolved to local government and they are given the resources to do it because they're the best place to be able to take the communities with them and actually solve that first mile, last mile problem, which is one of the th reasons why people don't uh, tend to use uh, alternative modes of transport than cars. Um, but, you know, the Tories, Tories, Tories uh, don't really get it. Um, I think there is an opportunity next year, however, uh, because there is a big election where we are hoping to be able to take hold of the County Council. Uh, and if that happens, then that is hopefully uh, an opportunity to do there what we're already doing on South Oxfordshire District Council and also in the Vale, uh, which is to show people that by electing uh, people other than Tories, that's how you get green uh, policies through. And that's how you get stuff done on this really important matter. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, um, Sam or or, um, or Ben, do you want to come in first? Yeah, I'll jump in on that. Um, so, yeah, I completely agree with Layla that, yeah, the local governments do have a massive role to play in this in terms of infrastructure and, you know, how people are getting from A to B. 
One thing I would throw back is I think the central government has a, a really important role to play in protecting vulnerable road users through new legislation. Um, so, for example, in the Netherlands, you know, if a cyclist collides with a car, usually the car driver is at fault. And that's, that's the default starting point. And, you know, once we have a law like that, um, you know, people will feel safer immediately because car drivers won't be as tempted to pull right behind your back wheel on your bike and know that they're going to get away with it, that it, it won't happen. Um, so, yeah, once we can have laws like that, you know, maybe I won't say the change will happen overnight. Of course it won't, but it will certainly happen a lot quicker. Um, I'd, I'd like to jump in there and say something about some people don't ride bikes or can't ride bikes. There's quite a few people who are disabled. And um, I, sometimes I wonder when you make bike lanes and, and walking lanes, what about the people who can't walk <laughs> or can't? Um, I, I worry about them as well. I don't know the solution to that, but that's... Well, see, there's, there's a group locally that's just started um, uh, a campaign to raise money for, I think they're almost like little rickshaws, electric rickshaws for people. Mm. Um, who can't, who don't have the same mobility, but it means they can get around. Uh, so I yeah. reached out to that. And yes, mobility yeah. scooters, but also, um, and uh, you know, as uncool as they look, but you know, the, um, uh, the, the oh, it's not just mobility scooters, it's the electric scooters. And you see them in, in other European countries and they are, they are, they're allowed. And in this country, they're banned. Mm. Um, I think we should allow them. And there is, um, I don't know if you know, there's a, there's a group called Wheels for All in Oxford. Um, they have fantastic bikes for people who have all, all abilities. Um, they're pretty expensive, you know, you'd, you'd need to be able to have a decent uh, subsidy for people to use those. Um, and it gives an amazing amount of freedom to people who often are stuck inside. Um, and then if you've obviously got to have a decent cycle lane and decent wide pavements. Um, and I think uh, what frustrates me is uh, when councils, governments say these things are too expensive when we see the billions that they put into the road network, but also the return on the investment is not calculated right. You know, it's not, they don't include the, uh, the carbon emissions, they don't, they don't include the, um, the pollution and the health costs, and they don't include the inactivity levels and the health problems that come from those, you know, the high levels of obesity and diabetes, et cetera, from inactivity. So, you know, those formula, so when, they, when we're talking about affordability, we need to bring in all the formula properly to, uh, to assure what we're actually going to be doing. We, we can see that. We know that in, uh, in the Netherlands, their structure start, their infrastructure became really good after there was a campaign called Stop the Child Murder. And I think Europe is absolutely right. You know, we need, to, we need to campaign very hard on changing that balance. That uh, the, We need to talk about motor crashes. And there's a great book by Chris Walker about this. He says you didn't you don't talk about car accidents, you talk about car crashes, you talk about uh, people being killed by motor vehicles, you know, and we have to change our language and how we approach how we get about. And free, you know, I've been to places in France, there's, there's uh, towns where you get free public transport around the town. You know, what's, what's not to like about that? I think we really agree that's a brilliant thing. Okay. Sorry, I'm interrupting. <laughs> we got another question coming up from Bob. Uh, would you like to ask your question, Bob? Yes, I've got apologies from Bob as well, I'm afraid. Um, he's had a family crisis. Um, so in the absence of a clear government plan, how do you think the return to school should be managed, given the complexity of the problem? Should individual schools be given autonomy over whether to return before September? I firstly thank you for my specialist subject question <laughs> but uh, I will I'm also aware that we need to leave space for everyone else to talk to so I will aim to be as quick as I can um, I'll start by saying that yes uh, the diagnosis of the problem in that the the government has been utterly shambolic of, of, on this is is correct uh, they have not been transparent it was always going to be the case that there was this was going to be difficult and they should have planned for how they were going to reopen schools as soon as they started reducing the number of children who went to them. It's also worth uh, saying, and you can, I can never say it enough, schools never closed. 
Um, so the rhetoric around reopening isn't really fair because it sometimes there are some people who use that to suggest that teachers are having a bit of a holiday uh, and they're definitely not uh, they are working all hours a lot of them have been doing the jobs of social workers during this time and deserve our thanks and love um, and you know should be defended against a government that uh, often doesn't understand uh, what they are going through so it was always going to be difficult it was always going to be about risk and reward because one you shut down a school uh, yes it was open to key workers but Vulnerable children, whilst they were eligible to come, weren't very often because their families are more precarious, maybe don't have access to the same uh, information um, or, you know, they just don't like it. And those are always the kids that are the hardest to get in school in the first place. Um, still a governor just about at Botley, although I'm becoming less and less effective. Um, but it is the thing that we're worried about the most is the number of vulnerable children who aren't able to get into school for whatever reason. There's all sorts of uh things that should be done and i've been calling for for example an army of supply teachers and former teachers and ex-social workers to add uh to the list of people that schools can call on to be able to do online tuition to have a minimum uh a minimum level of online tuition particularly for the most vulnerable um my fun fact of the week is that the government uh basically admits that there are 700,000 children in this country who don't have access to a mobile uh, sorry, sorry some kind of uh, device or broadband to access online learning uh, their answer to that is 100,000 laptops you do the maths um <laughs> They also then say, oh, there's another 230,000 to go, but that's still not 700,000. So they, they have not planned for how they're going to ensure that children are going to be taught. The SAGE minutes on this was released about an hour and a half ago. I looked at them just before I saw you. And what they say is that unless there is a test, trace and isolate program that is in place, then they, there is a risk that R could rise to as high as 1.7 with the reopening of schools. The way that you mitigate against that is to not have a full reopening, uh, but instead you continue to follow the public health advice that has been explored. So in Wales, for example, they are opening schools to all children, but it's on a rotation basis. And that's happening at the end of this month. And the reason they're able to do that is because they have better managed COVID there um, that is a Lib Dem uh, in government there. It's Secretary of State for Education is a Lib Dem uh, in coalition with the Labour Party in Wales. And uh, what she has done all along, and the reason she's able to do this, is she has kept good stakeholder management with the unions. She hasn't alienated people and she hasn't sought to divide along political lines. Meanwhile, the Tory government has done the exact opposite. It doesn't have the trust of teachers. Parents, as worried as they may be, are also just, you know, very, very, up, you know, they, they're desperate for their children to go back, but they're worried for the effect it's going to have on them and the effect it might have on their grandparents, uh, and uh, they have not been reassured. So what's the answer for September? Well, I do think that there should be maximum discretion to heads, and I think, however, that's pointless discretion to have if you're not really clear about the parameters in which that they, they need to operate. So I've got a five point plan that I've been pushing over the last couple of weeks for what I think should happen. Uh, one of the big problems, of course, is a lack of space. So introduce a spare space register in a county managed by the local authority. Uh, for example, you know, unused buildings, community centers, WI buildings, whatever it may be. Could they be used as spare classrooms to uh, have the children be socially distanced? But if you're going to halve the number of children in a class, you then have to double the number of teachers. I think we should have a recruitment campaign called something like Teach for Britain, um, because that worked actually pretty well with social workers. Uh, it did work. Um, and to get people who are out of the profession back in, supply teachers are on their knees right now. They need jobs. Let's give it to them. Um, and then uh, plan for a phased reopening that is probably going to be on a rotation basis in September. Today, Boris Johnson said that he wants all schools to go back full time, five days a week in September. Yet he has not answered the question of how he's going to achieve that without completely collapsing the rules around social distancing and without having a proper test, trace and isolate program in place. SAGE today made clear that that is not possible. 
So literally what Boris Johnson today announced is a pipe dream. And I don't see us getting to the point where this is going to be solved by September. So in summary, yes, I think it's going to be have to uh, have to be up to the heads uh, to make a judgment call. Um, and it's going to be a really, really difficult thing to do. Uh, I continue to press for clarity. Uh, and that's all I can really do at this point. Uh, I just wish I was in charge. Um, what can I say? Mm, okay, Sam or uh, Ben. Uh, I'll be super quick so we can move on. But wouldn't it be lovely to have a government that actually listened to its advisors? Um, <laughs> uh, so Layla is completely right about the SAGE minutes. And, you know, the SAGE did actually suggest to the government that we do a phased reopening of schools on a kind of rotational basis. That was one of the options that they modelled. But of course, you know, the option that we're currently running on was not modelled. Um, and you know that I, know. I feel like that's all I have to say. Yeah. And just to say, just quickly, that in in Scotland, you know, they're planning on for a lot of next, the whole of the next academic year, having you know part time schooling and part time online. And you know, if you're going to do that, and you probably have to do that, you need to start planning now. As we were saying earlier about the online access for children, it's really important to start planning that really, really early. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I think we have, do we have time for one more question? Okay, well, Mary, it's yours. Okay, well, this is about trade deals. Um, uh, during the recent debate on the Agriculture Bill, Victoria Prentice said the government have a manifesto commitment that in all trade deals, they will not compromise on our high environmental protection, animal welfare and food standards. But it now looks as though the government's preparing to renege on this in order to reach a trade deal with the US, which would undercut British farmers and drive down standards here. Um, how can we pre prevent not only this, but, but all deleterious trade deals? Um, I'm quite disappointed because, you know, given that Victoria is the neighboring, uh, one of the neighboring MPs, um, I, I just didn't, she must have been lied to is, is what I hope, rather than her herself lying, because it is a lie, because Liz Truss has now turned around and basically said that they are absolutely planning uh, to lower food standards. Interestingly, and this is what gives me some hope, I have run a little campaign on this recently, I've been doing um, some work with the NFU, um, I think, you know, we need to keep making the case for this is why we need to maintain our British EU food standards, you know, th these were British standards that the EU adopted and vice versa, and we shouldn't be deviating from them because, you know, we are cutting off our nose to spite our face. If we lower our food standards, then we're not going to be able to trade with our biggest trading partner in the same level that we were able to before. So it just seems utterly stupid um, to be doing this simply from a basic economic point of view. Um, but then there's also the uh, the welfare point of view. Um, and so I, this is, this is on my quest to, to court right wing press in order to get my, my points of view across to Boris Johnson. I, I recently challenged Liz Truss uh, to have a meal of chlorinated chicken, uh, which they carried uh, with a lovely cartoon in their paper. Um, but the point is, you've got to try and get their ear, you've got to try and get their attention. Uh, and so that's why I've been trying to get these kinds of stories in those kinds of publications. Because let's face it, if I'm harping on in The Guardian, they're not really going to be listening. Um, so that's been my tactic. Uh, but I also think there is no appetite, to coin a phrase, uh, out there in the public for a lowering of food standards. That's why they made it a manifesto commitment, because let's face it, everything in the Tory manifesto commitment was tested to death by Cummings et al and is basically a populist document. So if they then deviate away from that Tory manifesto by lowering food standards, I think they're going to come unstuck. So I don't know the answer to this, except that I can see how they get out of it, which is that they then realise, the public realises uh, that this is happening. And so keep your letters going, keep writing to your MPs, this is where a big campaign could make a massive difference. Um, and I think we can make them do a U-turn again uh, and stick to their own manifesto commitment. Right, um, Ben and Sam. 
Well, just, yeah, again, briefly because of time, um, it's just not acceptable to lower food standards. I think we know that. Um, uh, they will be, of course, going using the attack of um, letting the consumer decide and, and make a choice between cheap food and uh, more expensive food. And of course, it's not a real choice, is it? Um, there's also the issues of whether the, the whole ingredients and everything that's gone into that food will be on the label. I think that's something we've got to be really, um, really uh, strong in campaigning for, because in trade deals, you know, if we if if you're compromising on that and people don't know what they're eating, I think that's that's something that is really disastrous. Often people will buy the cheapest food. They don't have much money. They're stuck for cash. They will get the cheapest food. They really need to know what's in that. Um, so I think we need to keep pushing on every on every you know line of these trade deals and not let them get 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 any of these things through. Chlorinated chicken is you know the big headline, but actually there's loads of stuff under that. That, that we need to think about and um, and I agree with Sue Roberts we need to think about you know part of this Green New Deal we need to think about how we can grow more and better food in this country it saves on food miles saves on carbon and um, I'm not I don't want to get everyone back onto the land I think that's not always very practical <laughs> but but we need we do need to think about that and, and push the government in that direction as well mm. Mm. I think that's coming up to the time that uh, almost to the minute, we got like two minutes left. <laughs> Sorry, you're muted, Leila. Guys, they're just calling me. That's this noise. Okay. I'm so sorry to leave you. I've got to go uh, call the government to account. Um, but love you all. Thank you. Thank you.